Okay, and we are live. Okay, great stuff. Uh, Tony will be with us very, very shortly. That's Tony Cagini. Cagini, I always say it wrong. Um, so we'll get started on that any second. So we've had, hold on, who put that name like that down there? Who put that name? Uh, I don't know how to change it. So sorry about that. Okay. Somebody's put my name on weird on there. Okay, here's Tony. Tony, hey. how are you? How you doing? Good, to, good, good, good. Good to see you. Everybody? It's good to be seen. The one, the only, it is Tony. <laughs> <laughs> right. What's going on, guys? I've got to say a few things, Tony, before we start. Yeah, go ahead. You. i got to put my, my broken right. glasses on. I can't see. One of the staff put... Rudolph in the middle here because of this bloody thing I've got here. It's called Rosa Sear. It's come up the last couple of weeks. We're trying to get rid of it. I've got all creams on it. You got to learn to chuck it. <laughs> I should have been moving yeah. a bit quicker, but I don't know how to take that off. So I'm stuck with Rudolph. Right. Anyway, you look like WC Field. If you're <laughs> so here's uh, one of our guys, JG, just turned up. There's a, few, there's a load more on on here. I've got a load of questions. We've got some come in already which live ones coming in i've got some ones that have already been sent in so we'll cover those in a, in a bit robert hi yeah your questions come in got it i can see them all i don't know if you can tony no, but they're no. coming into me here right so anyway they, they keep coming in here but before we go on i've got to tell you a story about this gentleman right before i met him i'd heard a lot about him and i was over in chicago doing some stuff and the guy I was doing some stuff for took me to, to meet Tony. And when I first walked into his gym, I said, it's like um, walking into a set of The Sopranos, I said afterwards, <laughs> <laughs> the way it was. And it's proper, proper stuff in so much as there's, there's no lycra in this place. This is tough training. There's the, the wrestling mats, a grizzled old boxing -y bit, the lounge area. The poker bit, I, sort of, I remember. Yeah, the pool big table. There, the pool table, everything else. And you're made to feel super welcome the second you get there. And after we'd had a lot of discussion, I asked Tony to show me a couple of things. I just remember the, this line from him. I'll try, I can't do the accent, but I'll try it. And he goes, you know your stuff. I know my stuff. Let's go grab a beer. <laughs> that kind of thing. And that was it. But when our friends were training, when we were training together, uh, People out there will know of it. Me, Phil, Bart, and Amit, and Johnny Pants. When we were all training, training really hard, me, Phil, Bart, and Amit would look at Tony's stuff, go and train it. John would come and give us some pointers. Every now and again, he'd come up, or we'd go down there, and he'd help us out with some more stuff. And every single one of us, our ground game went through the roof by comparison to the length of time of training. And we had people come to train with us who'd done loads, 12 years, 15 years, 20 years. And just with a few months of doing it your way, Tony, they were struggling with us. Well, that's so nice we, to hear. We were forever grateful for it. And we were forever saying to each other, <laughs> what would Tony do? <laughs> so that's, and that's how we spoke when we were training as well. What would Tony do on this one? Yeah, it was just our way of saying thank you to you. Hey. So a big thank you to Tony. His stuff, you're welcome. I'm telling everybody out there, and I keep telling people, you've got to get his stuff. It's the best. Now, just so they know, I've learned this bit. Hopefully this works. That's where you need to go. I'll leave that on there for a while. Oh, yeah. So what... To the people who are watching that I'm running a, just a, a discount for these guys only on my digital downloads. So if you want to buy a digital download, when you get to the shopping cart, put in the code Russell with a capital R, you know, R-U-S-S-E-L-L, -L, and you'll get 30% off for the digital downloads. I'll put that up as there yeah. as, as well. So Let me know if you have a problem spelling it. <laughs> yeah, I'll put that up as well. So it comes up there. Yeah, I'll leave that on there for a bit from then I'll put it back. Now, some questions that have come in. Okay, so let's get on to questions. First of all, um, we're going to do the, the pressure point ones in a few minutes, but there's a, a lot of ones for Tony that we want. Okay, Matt from Devon has said, what's the difference between BJJ and catch wrestling? Oh, quite a bit of difference. Well, 
All right, we're going to talk generalities because BJJ yeah. nowadays is not like it used to be. BJJ has become very amalgamated. You know, they I've trained hundreds of BJJ guys, and they pick from different styles and so on. But generally speaking, what I do is very, very, very aggressive. Okay, a lot of techniques that would not be allowed in any sport, uh, uh, be it MMA or submission grappling of some sort. Um, so it's a lot more dominance. It's a lot more control oriented and pressurized and the submissions, if we're going to just deal with just the submissions alone, they're, they're a little more technical, you know, a lot more twists and a lot of different angles and, uh, you know, uh, more explosive, but also I teach a lot of strikes and incorporate all of that. And I always have. So again, in traditional jujitsu or, or judo, you know, you don't really have that. So it's it's a little more encompassing, but like I said, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guys for for a while now have been training with me or other stylists, so it's it's blended their style. You know, it's a lot of blend. Yeah, you see a lot of people incorporating catch into their BJJ now, and yeah, because they have to because the the locks done Tony's. Well, I'll just say Tony's way. Right, the locks done Tony's way for everybody out there. The principles that are being used, things like the, the twisting and the manipulation and the misalignment, making sure the balance is gone, making sure you're robbing them of the strength, the angles and things like that are all the things that we talk about in our training when we're doing talking about our stuff, when we're talking about what we call players, things that make a technique work. I remember having this conversation with Tony years ago when he was talking about different techniques and talking about points and where to go and how to make things work. And I said, we use that same terminology. And he said, well, there's no other way of explaining it. Um, well, the thing is, most other catch guys don't do it my way. You know, they they do it more of a judo jujitsu way or a professional wrestling way where the holds are looser and more uh, theatrical, I guess. But that's just because of there was no need in professional wrestling to do legitimate holds. As a matter of fact, yeah. you wouldn't want to do that because everything was choreographed and scripted. And I like to tell people it's kind of like, mm, and like let's say, Jackie, uh, like a Jackie Chan movie or uh, a martial art movie where, um, you know, you, you pull your punches. You're not really trying to injure your person, the person you're with. So you fight the way you train. So when you're constantly practicing with the holds being loose or being cooperative, you you never really reach the higher yeah. level. You think you can turn it on when you need to, but you don't. Yeah. <laughs> Can I get some more questions? Because Tony's got such an amazing background for those who don't know. So there's all sorts of stuff that he's done. Uh, Bruce, a uh, guy from Essex, um, he obviously knows. But um, what were the world records you had and how did you train for them? Well, the one was a push-up. The first one was push-ups, right? So I did. I wanted to do 120 push-ups in one minute. So I wanted to do two per second. I ended up getting 122 at my body weight. I was weighing right around 220. That's normally where I stay um, between 215 and 230. If, I, if I'm lifting heavy, I'm going to be 225 to 230. So the push-up thing, let me talk about that first because that was that was difficult. Because um, you really, you know, I did with my elbows in, you know, yeah. all the way down. I hit my chest and I locked out. I had my feet up against the wall. You know, the soles of my feet because you'd start to move. Um, and I had a guy, I had two guys, one helping me count, you know, because I kept it in my head. And then I had another guy with the timer. And I wanted him to count out every time I hit 10 seconds so I knew where, what my pace was. Okay, so that's how I did it. Now, how did I train for it? Um, I used the bench press to train for it. So I started with. I'll use American pounds, not kilos. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. I would have 140 on the bar, and I would work up reps, you know, um, till I could do like as many reps as I needed, you know, 80, 90 reps. It was no big deal. But I worked for speed. And then when I got that, I started to work up to about 180 pounds with, with speed. Now, remember, even though I weigh 220, when you're doing a push-up, I'm not moving all of 220 yeah. pounds. I'm moving a percentage of it. Yeah. So I used the bench a lot, and then I would um, train the push-ups in 15-second intervals. So I paced myself to do 30 in 15 seconds. 
And then I worked up to 40 in 20 seconds and, um, you know, on and on until I got up to about, I think, 40 seconds. When I was doing like 80 or 85 at 40 seconds, um, I knew that I was ready. So I waited about a week or 10 days. You know, I was fully rested and I gave it a shot. And I think the first time I did it, I did 118. And then a couple a couple of days later, I tried it again, and that's when I hit 122. Um, and and I did it again at a seminar that I did once, and I did exactly the same, 122. Um, record. The other one, the other record was a strict curl, okay? And on my worth the weight video, I show how I was training on a machine. But when I actually did the curl, I, I can't demonstrate it here, but you back up against the wall and you log out. And um, a lot of heavy heavy curls and a lot of negatives so um actually i ended up doing 270 in the gym um but so i did a full curl with 270 but what i would do ultimately is i would have 300 pounds on the bar and i'd have a spotter and then i would just negative curls you know bring it down yeah. help me get it up and then i would slowly try to bring it down can you just say for people in England, that's just over, that's over 19 stone, right? Just so that 270 is over 19 stone, which is enormous. Yeah, but I wasn't stoned when I did it, okay? <laughs> I, don't, I don't get high. <laughs> but, yeah, so uh, the curls, and then I worked my front delts because, uh, believe it or not, your delts pull um, – I'll do it with this arm. You, you kind of got to bring it in. So this is working your deltoid muscles as well. So I did a lot of um, delt work. As a matter of fact, I used to um, email, like when people would buy the uh, the product, I would email my actual routine. Um, and I probably still have that somewhere on my computer. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of work. And then I actually broke my forearm, or my wrist, I should say, near my forearm. I, I got a spiral fracture because it's a lot of weight, you know. And your body is just isn't, you know, designed to handle that. And... Um, you know, through the years, I have gotten a lot of injuries. I, I need to tell another story of the day I met Tony. He just won an arm wrestling. I think it was some championship arm wrestling championship. And he was explaining to me about it. And it was then he explained to me that he'd won it with his weak hand because he had an injury on his strong one. And then they wouldn't let him go to the world finals because it, it, they didn't want him to use his strong. He, had to, he would have to stay on the hand that he won with, which was his weak hand. And well, then, yeah. Because it was a weird way to arm wrestle. And I had torn my right arm. And my right arm is not – my left arm is better for, for arm yeah. wrestling. But, yeah, uh, the funny part about that, I don't know if I told you this, but you remember the girl that I was seeing at the time, remember? Yes, okay. yes, yes. She, she was there for this uh, arm wrestling tournament, right? So in the finals, I mean, I was like, oh, I was in so much pain because I had tore my brachialis, which goes right here. Yeah. Side of your I mean, I'm in agony for the finals. So I get the guy, I win, and I can't even go up there to get the airline ticket. They were giving us vouchers to go to Vegas. I had never been to Vegas. I still have never been to Vegas. But long story short, I'm in so much agony, and I'm like, just give give it to my girlfriend. Give it to my girlfriend. What does she do? She breaks up with me. She takes the ticket vouchers, and her and her girlfriend get to go to Vegas. <laughs> well, at least they got to go to Vegas. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, another one for you. Um, I'll come back to the weight training one in a minute, but this is now moving on to uh, self-defense stuff. I, I already know the answer to this one for Tony. It's a question for Tony. There's some I questions for both. Hearing, so. coming up. Sorry, this is a question for Tony. There are some questions for both of us coming up, but I want to get the Tony ones done first because I want to make sure people have a chance to to hear what this man has to say. Because I'm telling you now. Right. There's only I've met so many people in martial arts. I've met so many heroes, so many masters and stuff like that. And this this is the the man, right? It's end Thank of story. You. Right. Right. The truth is the truth. Right. So I already know the answer to this one. This guy, uh Sam, he didn't say where he's from. I won't give you last name, Sam. I don't give people's last names out just in case. Uh boxing or catch or judo for self defense. So okay. I, think it's, I think I know the answer. <laughs> right. Well, I don't know if you know the answer, but 
self-defense again that's a big picture because so many different things happen i'll put it to you this way you know my favorite takedown is a left hook if i can keep it on the feet i'm going to keep it on the feet so yeah i'm going to speak in generalities because you know anything can happen but generally speaking in a perfect world i'd rather strike you down um I don't necessarily want to go to the ground in a street fight because too many things can happen. Um, we don't need to elaborate, but you can use your imagination. Other people, or you can get stabbed, you can get bitten, and you know you don't need that that stuff happening. So, um, and a punch can happen so quickly, and it can end the fight instantly. Whereas wrestling is a little more uh, detail oriented. It, unless you can grab the guy and launch him, throw him land him on his head or something like that and end it. But um, I've always been an advocate of combining the boxing and the wrestling because then you could control the landscape. You know, um, nobody's going to take you down because you have, let's say, the wrestling. You can throw the punches to keep the guy at bay. You know, if you do, do get taken down, let's say blindsided or something, you got the ability to get back up if you need to. So, but for me, I always look to, yeah. To strike because I don't want to mess up this beautiful hair. You know, I mean, getting on the ground, it's not yeah. worth it to me. I know what you mean. I know yeah. what you mean. It's and best to look good. Exactly. <laughs> look good while you're doing it. Yeah. I've Style always said program. there's nothing safer than an opponent who's unconscious. Yeah. Nothing safer. Absolutely. So, and I always say A on B as hard and as fast as you can. And that tends to work pretty well. So, yeah. I, I I had a buddy of mine who was a prof he passed away. He was a professional fighter, boxer. He was a champ. Johnny Lira. I, I've talked about him. And one of one of his things used to be, you know, throw as many punches as you can, as hard and as fast as you can in a street fight. Yeah. Just, just blitz the guy, you know? Yeah. It works. It works. Uh, which leads on to this next question from Mike. I won't give you a last name, Mike. Uh uh, do you advocate punching to the head as opposed to using open hand strikes or hammer fist? And if so, which knuckles do you use and how do you prepare your, well, several questions here. And how do you prepare your hands to prevent injuries? Well, do I you advocate, I'm sorry, go so, ahead. Uh, so punching or yeah. open hand or hammer fist to the head. Well, let's, let me clarify by, I don't like to hit to the head. I like to aim for the face. There is yeah. a difference. Um, if I'm going to throw a punch, I aim with my – well, first of all, now hear, hear this out before somebody jumps to a conclusion. The way your arm is – let me see if I can get it in the video here. Your, your pinky knuckle would be the one that would line up straight, but that's the most fragile bone in your hand. So you, I move it over. I use my middle knuckle to aim. So generally uh, – it's hard for me to figure this out. Okay. I try to aim with my middle knuckle and land here, but I look for soft tissue. Um I will do a palm heel strike. Uh, hammer fists I don't do on my feet because it's going to leave me way open, vulnerable to, to getting countered. On the ground, it's a whole different story. But, yeah, I look for the soft tissue area. If the guy's bent over or something like that, then I don't, I don't have to strike. That's when I'm going to use a knee or an elbow. I shouldn't say it. I wouldn't have to strike with my hands. Or I can well, slap you, on the You can always figure for a face by the bum. Exactly. But – yeah, I don't. I try to aim soft tissue to the throat. I might, you know, touch the guy, you know, fake him with, with an open hand just to open something else up. But, and I advocate this for everybody: learn and practice your hooks to the to the liver, to the solar plexus. That's where all the blood is. You you can fake the guy and get in there with a power shot to the body. Man, you're gonna you're gonna do good, and then follow up with any other kind of strike. But, yeah, you – oh, he asked about how I conditioned my hands, too. You know, I used to hit into sand, you know, a bucket of sand, and I would do some knuckle push-ups. But you guys, especially in, in, in the U.K., have a long history of bare-knuckle boxing, right? And those guys aren't breaking hands all the time, all right? They're not coming out with broken hands a lot. Um, anything can happen, but in a street self-defense situation, the last thing I'm worried about – is, is breaking a knuckle or skinning my knee or ripping my pants. I've had questions asked about that stuff. Man, I just want to be able to survive this encounter. And, you know, I improvise. You know, whatever whatever thoughts coming into my head, I'm going to, you know, use it. 
yeah, you, you got to survive it and make sure that your hair is still in place. And as long oh, as that, man, in place, no, I got to no. look good. Even, exactly. on the, even if it's on an ambulance ride to the hospital, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> look, yeah. When it, when it comes to, to um, which part of your hand for a strike and stuff like that, I say I don't care. As long as it lands, because in a fight, bare enough, boxing gloves, it doesn't matter too much. You're protected. You could punch incorrectly and still get away with it. And you could even get away with it your whole career punching incorrectly because you've got boxing gloves on. Yeah, when it's bare knuckle, you don't get away with it. But it doesn't matter in a self-defense situation because you're not looking to be fighting the next week, the next day. <laughs> you're not looking for rounds after rounds. You're looking to put them away. And I don't care what lands. I I've landed with this part. 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 It's just what lands at a time. Because when you throw it, you might be throwing it exactly right, but the other person does move. It's a fight. Right. So they might turn slightly, which is altered the angle. Lots of things happen. So I don't worry too much about it. In practice, I try to perfect it knowing that it may never, ever be right for real. Well, another thing, because I've been in a lot of encounters like that, you know, street stuff, and you have – um, your body tends to go into shock. You 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 don't hurt like you would think you would hurt. You know, let's say you're working around the house and you, you hit you're, – you're nailing something and you hit the hammer on your yeah. thumb. That hurts, right, because you're not expecting that. But when you're in a street situation – you know, when you see it coming, you're prepared. You know, your adrenaline starts to flow, and you you have a higher tolerance for pain, um, and that works both ways. Also, your opponent will probably have a higher tolerance for pain, you know, or he may be on uh, drugs and so on, and certain things that may work for you in the gym, you know, or a pain hold or compliance hold. You're not going to be able to do that on somebody in the street, perhaps. You're, you, you're going to have to snap it. You're going to have to break that guy. Um, yeah. So, yeah, don't forget that, you know, that your pain management is really different in a true crisis situation. On, on that, we stole this from Tony. Um, oh, boy. I don't I know if I... <laughs> yeah, but we stole it from him. We would be practicing groundwork a la Tony's way. And when somebody got a lock on you and you were ready to tap, you tapped and then... The person holding it on would only release it slightly, at which point then where you know it's not going to break, they've released it slightly for you, so you've got a little bit of movement. You would then resist it like crazy and fight it as they slowly, slowly put it back to the tap position, to where you were tapping. And eventually we found that when these locks were going on, whatever it was, top wrist lock, double wrist lock, whatever, that our tolerance for it got higher and higher. And also the, the actual amount of twist or movement that they were putting on to get the tap got a little bit bigger. But our, our ability to fight it massively increased. Our ability to withstand the pain massively increased. And I got that off Tony when, on one of his DVDs. He was saying that they use that as a training practice, put the lock on, put it on or the choke, or whatever it is, release it slightly, fight it, put it back on, release it, fight it, release a bit. Not release, release, but just release enough for you to fight, and then put it back. Release enough to fight, put it back. And we stole that off, Tony, and it worked wonders for us. So just, so it's out there. So thank you for that, Tony. We, Cheers. Another, one we, another one we stole. <laughs> Some more. There you go. Uh, this one came in, and I, I didn't get the name. Hold on. It was, a, it was sent in by Christian. And we had to translate it. So I don't know if it's been translated properly, but this was sent in and, and we had to translate. So the best defense against a knife attack. Thanks to my friends, my heart is floating like a hammer. How about that? So best defense against a knife attack, knock them out. I can't think of a better one. Track shoes. Yeah, yeah. If you, got if you, got, yeah. you if, can run. If there's no way out, you got yeah, to knock I, them out. I'm yeah. being facetious, but, you yeah. know, I have kind of like a different approach to uh, – because I've been involved with, with, with that. I've been stabbed on numerous occasions. I got a buddy sitting here who, who was a witness to, to, to it on two different occasions with me. Um, I look at the whole opponent as the weapon. I don't just look at the knife itself, let's say, if you can even see the knife. Against a good knifer, you're, you're not going to see it. But I look at the whole person, and I try to assess all the openings because – 
you know, he may be, now again, we're talking in generalities here. He may be so, you know, positive that his knife is going to do the trick or intimidate you that, you know, he may be coming at you, you know, like this, let's say, and leaving himself totally wide open to be counted, yeah. you know, what, with a hook or a kick or whatever it is. So I will sacrifice the outsides of my arms, never the insides, never where all the tendons and ligaments are. I will, I will sacrifice that, but whatever you decide to do, you want to protect your neck and you want to protect your gut. You know, you don't want to get stuck yeah. with the knife. A slash I'll deal with. But honestly, I look at the whole person. Where is his vulnerability? He may be up, he may be up high with the knife. Okay, so I might, you know, go for the groin, fake him up, you know, get his hands up, go for the groin, groin strike. Um, but, yeah, I don't generally just think about, oh, the knife, the knife, the knife. No, I mean, because now I'm freaking out. You can't freak yourself out. Yeah. Look at I, I think you've, you've also got to assume in any situation, even if you've not seen a weapon, you have to assume that they've got one. Well, that's that why you, it's dangerous to grapple with a guy because, you know, yeah. You grab the guy, all of a sudden he's reaching into his back pocket or into his sock, and he's sticking you. You know, yeah. I covered this on that Snap No Tap series. I, I really get into it in depth about how to frisk a guy when, when you're in a grappling situation. You know, I don't know if you guys know the term, but frisk where you can where you, you feel yeah. them and you, you can try to tell where a weapon is. And, yeah, you always have to assume the worst. Yeah. I do. Yeah, we always say assume that they're armed, assume that they're bigger, stronger, faster, better, everything yeah. else. That you've got to take them out as quickly as humanly possible. And if you can hit them to knock them out, hit them. If it doesn't knock them out, you are allowed to hit them again. It's a fight. So, um, because well, a lot well, of people say, what if that point, what if that point you're aiming for doesn't work? Well, it's it again. What well, if, I'm not a like, lawyer and I'm not advocate, you know, I'm not yeah. going to give any legal advice here, but I can tell you from my experience in the United States and in the, in the municipalities that I've lived in, when a gun or a knife or anything like that is, uh, you know, a weapon is, is brandished, you know, that elevates the situation where, you know, your life is in danger now. And the use of deadly force, you're going to get away with more, you know, so like to, to piggyback on what you said about hit him and hit him again and hit him again, until you know the guy is disarmed, uh, or unconscious, you know, you, you have a little more leeway to do things. And I don't want to get into other things that I yeah. do not here. In, because- in most countries, I can't think of a country where it's not true. You, you are legally within your rights to keep hitting until the threat is over. Well, yeah. And I do other things besides just hitting. So let's yeah, leave it saying, you know, whatever it may be until the threat is over. Let's put it this way. There are times when you'd be justified in chopping their head off with a samurai sword and it would still be classified as self-defense. There are times when you could pull a shotgun straight through their head and it's still classified as self-defense. And there's times when you could just give them a slap on the wrist and that's classified as assault. And there's everything in between. So if the threat is real and blah, 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 you, you are allowed to neutralize the threat and it takes more force than what they're giving you to neutralize the threat. So, uh, Robert, um, He's saying, when shooting on the move, one pulls the trigger the instant he steps. Okay. Do you see a correlation of timing when making contact with strike as one makes the step? Okay. Repeat that again. I need to. uh, Yeah, I need to ask that again. When shooting on the move, one pulls the trigger the instant he steps. I'm assuming that's the target. Do you see a correlation of timing when making contact with strikes? as one makes the step. Okay. I, I'm going to assume here because that he's, when he's saying shoot, I'm, I'm assuming he means go in for a takedown. Um, everything is about timing. Yeah. And I, I've talked about this before many times and that's as you age or as you get rusty, you know, you may know all the techniques. You may not forget your techniques, but your reflexes and your timing go. And yeah. Timing is so important. And one of the frustrating things is when you know there's an opening and you just, by the time the opening is there, you can react, it's closed. So 
you always have to be in perfect stance. Oops, sorry. You got to be in perfect stance and in perfect position to um, capitalize on that opening. So this question about timing, whether it be wrestling oriented or striking oriented, yeah, timing is the key. So here's a little trick as you get older. You've got to create those openings. You can't just like wait for the guy to to do it, especially in a street scenario. You don't have time. You've got to force the, those openings, and you've got to become very creative with it. And sometimes it isn't even anything like with my hands or legs. It could be just something like me looking away, looking over the guy's shoulder to get him to think that something's happening, and boom, you've just created the opening. Um, or look down on the ground. You know, the, anything to trick this guy to think, What's going on here? We we yeah. have a saying in our boxing stuff is that you, you give them a present and then take it away before they can get it. So we might we might give them something and then take it away. Knowing that they're going to try and take the present, you take it away as they're going for it and then you're away. It's the same sort of principle. Is you, you, you're tricking them into it. You, it's using deceit, deception. I've, I've dated a lot of women that would do that. Yeah, they give me a present <laughs> and then they take it away. <laughs> Ain't that life? <laughs> Ain't that life? Uh, we got another question from uh, Mike again. Another, uh, it's the same Mike, I think. Yeah, we won't use your last I, name. Mike. I we don't use people's last names. Tony, you obviously like weightlifting as part of your conditioning. Sorry, I'll start again. Tony, you obviously like weightlifting as part of your conditioning. But what are your thoughts on Carl Gotch's method and the use of primarily using calisthenic, calisthenic, calisthenics for conditioning? Well, it wasn't his method. That's been around forever. And I do use that. And I actually had a video out on that years and years ago called The Routine, still on my website. Squats, uh, push-ups, uh, even the Lucky 13, which is a great exercise uh, routine. That's what I train all my guys with. And there's no weightlifting involved in that whatsoever, except I will have a guy, you, you uh, piggyback, uh, you know, to work your legs. But yeah, I advocate... Um, all sorts of body weight exercises. But remember now, I'm multifaceted as all of us are. We have other uh, um, likes and dislikes. I just like to be strong in general, okay? it's got to, Yes, it helps me with my fighting, but just in general, to me, it's always been great to be strong because I was a skinny little kid, and I didn't want to be that way. I wanted to be bigger and stronger. But, yeah, I do advocate certain body weight exercises, not, not just anything, but yeah. – they have to pertain to making you uh, a better fighter. So work on endurance, work on quickness and explosiveness. Those are the things. Doing 5,000 squats is fun, right? It's okay, it's, it, but it, it's, it's not practical anymore. It doesn't you, – you, you get to a point of diminishing returns. So you just need to have enough fitness that it's going to get you through your encounter. And on that note, let me just say this. This is not scientific, but this is just something that I've learned through the years through experience. Whatever your conditioning level is in the gym, you can divide that by a factor of 10 for the street. So let me put it this way. Let's say you can go 10 minutes in the gym. On the street, divide that by 10. You're going to have about a minute in, of gas in your tank on the street because if you don't have it up here, you're going to blow out in the street, right? You're going to freak. Because in the gym, the way most people train, and it's a sad way to train, it's all fun and games. There's no, um, your adrenaline doesn't get up. You don't really have any fear in the gym. You know, you're not triggering any of those things. So you can wrestle or fight or box at a slow pace, knowing, okay, if I get in trouble, my partner's going to stop. You don't have that in street. So, you know, your heart's pumping, you're maybe hyperventilating. So you may tend to blow out quicker. So whatever your routine is, be it calisthenics or body weight exercises or lifting, you know, you want to have overkill. You really want to have a level of fitness that you will never have to worry about it, you know, when you're on the street. Um, and then take in your lifestyle. Are you a heavy drinker? Uh, do you like to go out and eat? You know, are you going to get jumped after you just had a big meal? Um, all of that factors in to, to your fitness level. Yeah. at the moment of encounter so it, it, it's it's a deep subject yeah i mean we always say with the fitness and conditioning training that if your training is that tough 
that hard that you don't want to go, then you, you're probably doing it right. But it also builds into your mindset. You know that that guy in the bar who wants to, who's being an ass, wants to pick a fight or whatever, you know for a fact he ain't putting through anything like what you put yourself through every day of the week. So when it comes down to it, you're going to be up here. You've got it. You know that you're done, you've done stuff that he would never, he could never even attempt. You've, tra you've trained that hard that you're ready for it. To me, that training hard not only helps you physically, it's a huge help mentally because you know that they aren't doing the training you're doing. Even if it's just sports fighting and you train that much harder than everybody else, you go into the ring or the cage or, what, or on the mat or whatever it is, you know they haven't trained like you. So even if they beat you, they still haven't trained like you have. And you, that mental toughness will help you get through a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff. That's really what it's that's yeah. really 90 percent of it is 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 up here i mean 90 percent mental 20 percent training five percent maths 44 <laughs> percent. Well, but don't you, you have to be mental you got to get psyched up to even go to the gym to work out to begin with right or yeah. you have to be strong mentally to know today's not the day to go to the gym maybe you, you have an injury yeah. or whatever the case may be yeah. or or you're at the gym and you're gassing out you're tired or whatever, your mind's not there, stop. You have to yeah. have the mental power to stop because you're going to reinforce bad habits. If, if you're too tired to throw a punch and you're throwing punches like this, that's yeah. muscle memory. That's no no good, man. You have to say to people, take your rest in between your punches. If you're tired, back off, shake it off, come back. But when you're punching, do them right. Yeah. Do them right. If you're tired, you can't throw it right, move off, move around, get yourself right so you can come back then do them right. Never practice them bad. Always practice them good. It's one of our big, that's a huge thing for me. Practice it right. Now, going back to Robert's question about uh, the the uh, the shooting, it was not shooting in. He was talking about shooting a gun and he's saying, you miss the target if the foot's not planted. Right? Okay, I'm still not sure I understand, Robert, but kind of like posting. Okay, I understand. Posting for striking for us is, is where you're posting, you're posting ready so, so you can lay off multiple shots with the weight transfer slightly over to one side. So we would call that posting for, in boxing. A lot of martial arts call it like standing on one leg, like a karate kid thing, which is not posting. But we're saying where the weight slightly transferred, where you're able to multiple shots off of one side, but you can still throw the other side as well. Where instead of a lot of people where they're woof, Woof. and then they can't throw in multiple because they transferred too far. They can only throw the opposite side. So I think he's talking about the same thing with... Yeah, and, with and, and that all boils down to you as the person have not learned to control your body. So if you can't control yourself, you're not going to be able to control another person. Be it a gun, be it a baseball bat, be it whatever you have, empty hands. You've got to learn to control, and, and all that boils down to is balance, Um <laughs> proper footwork, learning about angles. Um, you know, there's just so much to it. It's 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 not something that you're going to learn in a weekend. It's not something you're going to learn in a year. You know, it, it takes continual study to to master your own body and master the principles of all of this. Well, we, we, we were covering that on today with my guy who does boxing with me about the balance on a certain, certain way of moving where – it was just off of a simple, what seems like a simple jab, cross, hook, and then on the hook, you've gone from in front of the guy to spinning around to get to the side of him, off of the hook, which sounds pretty easy, but it's quite a involved lot of footwork, balance, timing, movement, all sorts of things going on. But it's understanding that balance. When people don't understand their balance, they can go unconscious like that in boxing. You know, if you if your head goes over your knee either side or in front, yeah. you you're done. All those little things we say, keeping your head in between your knees, we call it the tracks. So keep yourself inside the tracks, so that you got some balance. But anyway, balance is a huge subject. We talk about it all the time. Um, okay, uh, hello to a lot of people like Wayne and, and John and blah blah. Some people. Hello. hello. Yeah. Blah blah. Um, now a question. Your favorite place to hit to knock them out? Well, you want to go for the button, you know, yeah. hit them on the button. But again, in the street fight, 
you got to watch. You you you, yeah. you can kill a guy not just the punch itself, but the guy falling and hitting and hitting his head. So a button is a good place to knock him out right in the nose, um, to tear up his eyes, and uh, you know that's a. I don't want to say a safer target, but you know, you could lure the guy like with a fake. Let's say you want to. I like to jab a lot, so yeah. I might fake a lead with the right just to get him to do something, and then boom. Stiff that jab straight down the middle. So even if you he moves or something, you're still gonna land. But yeah. generally, if I want to knock him out, I'm gonna I'm gonna go for the button. Right. But again, yeah, it it depends on what the guy's. You know, if he's a pro fighter, he's gonna keep his shit up. You know, yeah. but yeah. most people are gonna be like this. You know, wide open, and you can go for the throat, but that's a little harder to get because all the guy has to do is yeah. this or shoulder roll it. Yeah, but and if he's got, and if he's got several chins, it's even more difficult to get to the front. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and some people are like this as well. They're sort of like they're, they're no necks, and you know, hitting them back here where they go out easy. Sometimes you can't even get to it because they're just like this. You know, some people are just built out. It's just a question of whatever's in front of you. Yes, well, we all have favorite places, but if it's not there, you have to have a second favorite, a third favorite. Whatever. And That's why I always say my favorite place is whatever I can hit. Yeah. Well, we talk in generalities because you could, yeah. you could, every scenario is so different. So that's why I think improvising, learning how to improvise is so important. Um, yeah. Like you just said, one, two, three, four, you have all this stuff to fall back on. But here, it's like this. Like today, coming on here, I've never done this before, uh, this video thing. So I, I didn't practice what to say. I'm improvising, right? And that's yeah. how you have to be when you're fighting. You have to develop a vocabulary of techniques. And that comes from experience, either personal experience or you have to witness things. You, you know, you, you can't just think you can create stuff. You, you, you have to have the experience to develop that vocabulary where you can improvise with all variety of techniques that you have. Yeah. Now, here's one, another one that I stole, everybody. This is me, super honest. Another one I stole from Tony, and I could really relate to it because he talks about pool. Now, Tony's apparently a decent pool player. I haven't played him, so I can't vouch for that, but apparently he is. But I used to play snooker to a decent level. I could make 100 breaks quite, quite every day, but there you go. But Tony said, if you imagine, if you imagine pool or snooker for us guys in England, you've got a cue action, and it's straight. So your cue action is your cue action. But every single shot you make on that pool table or snooker table is different. All the, the angle is different. The amount of uh, what you would call English, we call side, screw back, draw, whatever. Whatever you put on that ball is different every single shot. The distance between the shots is different. But the basic cue action is the same. And it's the same with your techniques. Your technique is going to be the same per se, but it's going to be done slightly different in every single time you do it, in every single occurrence, every single time. It's never done exactly the same because you're never in, well, you occasionally you will be in the same position. But if you're, if you're punching somebody with a jab, it's never exactly the same as the next time you punch them with a jab. There's always going to be a slight difference. It might only be a few millimeters. The, the, the distance might be different. Your positioning might be different. Their head could be in a different place. They could be moving away, moving forward. It's slightly different, but you're still doing a jab. And that's Ronnie O'Sullivan. Ronnie O'Sullivan. Right. Comes a snooker, right? Oh yeah, Riley and O'Sullivan. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, but you're you're right. I mean, and don't forget, the, boxing wrestling judo jiu-jitsu tournaments you're used to the the wardrobe you're wearing the 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 flooring that you're going to be on be it a ring or a mat or whatever man in a street scenario you could be on snow you could be on ice you could be jammed up against something so you may have to jab from a position that you you've never jabbed from before right you may yes. not be able to get into a traditional fighting stance to pull this off yeah. so that's why you truly have to have Total control of your body, you know. Um, you you just do, and this is something that you can't just take for granted. You've got to practice outside of the gym. You've got to really handicap yourself. I used to tell guys, get outside in the snow, get outside in the ice and the rain, or 
Or if you like to drink, let's say you're, you love to get, hey, get drunk and try to work out when you're drunk against somebody who's sober. You do puke a lot easier when you yeah, train. Right. <laughs> Don't run off on your bar tab, though. Pay your bar tab. Keep the bar tab. <laughs> but we we um, used to practice strikes from bad positions, so that you could you used to being in an awkward, you used to being off balance, you used to being in exactly the wrong place, and you still got to strike from it. You still got to try and hit hard enough to get them off, even knock them out from a bad position. We, we, and places where you've got to create the space, create the opportunity, things like that. That all comes as part of your daily training if you're training properly. Some more questions, Tony, for you. Um, heavyweight speed training, and this is from Gabrielle. It's, it's more of a statement, really, I think. Heavyweight speed training and extreme conditioning is the way to do it, but it's discipline, motivation, and consistency is the main factor. Yep. And that boils back to what I was saying about having the mental, 90% yeah. mental, to, to focus in on going to the gym, uh, yeah. training properly, knowing when to not train. She's 100% right. And um, yeah. here's the one thing that I'm most proud of, right? Um, when you look at a lot of the other guys, some old timers that may not be with us anymore, they may have passed away. A lot yeah. of them let themselves go physically. And I mean, at a young age, in their 30s, 40s, 50s, they're all, not me, you know, I believe and I mean, I'm still the same. Okay, when I filmed the Lost Out of Ho Hooking in 1999, I weighed 225. When I filmed the Snap No Tap in 2008, I weighed 225. You know, today sitting here, since I'm not lifting heavy, I'm at 217. So I'm, I'm always going to stay within that window. And I want to work on my quickness, like she said, because I have fast twitch fibers, muscle fibers. I used to be a sprinter in, in high school, 100 meters. So it's all about discipline. Like she said, um, I'm assuming it's a she, Gabrielle. Um, I apologize if it isn't. Um, yeah, it, it, it all stems from up here. You know, watch what you eat, watch what you how you work out, and don't let age deter you. You know, I get a lot of people that say to me, they email me, Tony, am I too old to learn? No, you may be too old to be as good as somebody who's in their 20s, but you will get better by working out in six months or a year from now. You will be better than if you didn't work out. So, yeah, it's motivation. We still train every day. Well, not every day. We still train five or six days a week. Hard, hard training. Hard training. There's young fighters in the gym who can't do what we do. They can't do the rounds that we do at the intensity that we do. And they're professional fighters. It's all about up here, like Tony said. If you got it up here, you'll do it. You know, we're the same age and we still train. So anybody younger, you got no excuse. No excuse. Um, yeah, but I don't let people punch me in the nose like they happen to you. <laughs> yeah, you don't end up like this. You know? but, <laughs> at, least, at least I had the good grace to shave my hair. That's right, Rudolph. <laughs> uh, one from Red. It would be, wouldn't it? Red, right. Hi, Russell. Hi, Tony. How is it important to use pressure points in fighting? Yeah, if, if you can... It's like anything. It's a, I make no excuse for this. I keep telling people, I've been telling people for 20 odd years, it's a learned skill. You don't just, and it doesn't replace anything either. That's another one. And people see you say just doing something, like when Tony demonstrates a lock or something like that, or a choke on somebody, he doesn't whack the lock on and break their arm. He doesn't put them unconscious. Well, he does occasionally, but he doesn't put them unconscious, right? He shows it and teaches it. There's a huge difference between teaching speed and power training speed and power and a real fight a huge difference so when you're teaching something you say this is where you go and you just give it a little tap or whatever that's teaching you would smack it as hard as you possibly could in a real fight just like in a real fight you wouldn't just gently slowly apply the lock and explain what you're doing while you're doing it you just whack it on and rip it and break it whatever but they're in addition to what you know. If your technique's no good, neither are points. Simple as that. I've been saying it for years. Uh, oh, no, that's a, it's a statement from John here. Not a thing. It says, you have that every night with a pint and a cigar. No, we don't. No, it's Nelly. The answer. It's somebody, one of our guys talking about beer and cigars. I said, no. Do you, you, you have a cigar now and again, I think, Tony. And I've, I've seen you have a beer. There you go. Look at that. Look at that, everyone. Proper stuff, right? 
Again, when we first met, Tony said, we'll go and grab a beer. I thought, this would be good. American beer. He's got no chance. Actually, he could drink pretty good. <laughs> had a lot more than I could. But there you go. Damn it. Because every time we had an American instructor come over to England or whatever and say, try a beer, they'd end up with one beer at our pub or something like that and then collapse drunk. So when you said to me, let's go grab a beer, I was thinking to myself, he's got no chance. <laughs> Here we go. I don't know if we have time for this quick story, but do you remember what happened when me, you, and the girl I was seeing when the three of us went out and we were at that bar? When the TV was three seconds or four seconds? Yeah, yeah. 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 So I got to tell them the story. So yeah. this is when this is when high definition television was first coming out, and um, so she was a bartender, but we went to a place that she worked at, but she wasn't working. So she had a they had a high definition television. We were sitting at a table, and their back was to the Russell and her back were, was to the high definition television, and they had the standard definition TVs playing. Well, there was a delay, okay. The standard definition televisions were delayed by three seconds. I saw the high definition TV. <laughs> so I told her, I said, you know, I'm, I have psychic abilities. And I was predicting every television commercial that was going to come on. Three seconds and every, before it came on. And every, and every shot on the baseball. <laughs> and we were watching baseball. Every play on the baseball field, I, I called it before they saw it. And she was like mesmerized. Oh, my God. Oh, this guy, he can read my mind. And then he had to blow it for me. He had to let her in on it. I was just laughing. I couldn't help it. I, would, I could see the TV that was Hot blocker. giving you the thing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I resemble that remark. Yeah. <laughs> uh, another question from Red. What's the difference of martial arts and self-defense? Well, there's no rules in self-defense. There's rules in martial arts. You can use martial arts for self-defense, but you don't need martial arts for self-defense. You know, I know people have not done a day's martial arts in their life, but you you want them beside you in a barroom brawl. You well, choose I, them. I agree. You know how the yeah. Filipinos, the Filipino martial arts are no yeah. no for amongst you know like stick a knife and the knife fights. Yeah. I used to tell people, I said, go to any prison in the United States. And I doubt you'll find any Filipino martial artists in those prisons. The, the guys who stab you and shoot you and ball at you, yeah, they're not martial artists, right? Well, they're just street fighters, right? I went to the World Championships for uh, stick fighting in Cebu. Those guys are there. great. Yeah, yeah. It was incredible. Now, I was watching it, and at the side of the mats, they're doing the, the, the training – and they're doing these disarms and stuff like that and all sorts of amazing stuff. I was watching it. I go, that is absolutely fantastic. I've got no, I, there's no way I could do anything like that. And then when the fight started for the world championships, there was not one disarm. It was just, <laughs> like that. I went, yeah, they're not the same. Yeah. And then I was chatting to a couple of guys who'd come over from England. They said, oh, no, no, no. The fight is nothing like what we practiced. There you go. And that, to me, tells a lot of stories about martial arts because you take something like boxing, your fight in boxing is exactly how you practice. Whereas a lot of martial arts, your practice is nothing like the fight. And that, that's a, you know, a sad truth. Now, for people out there, this is where you got to go. CatchWrestle.com, right? Use this code, because Tony's done a discount for everybody who uses that code. Yeah, that's for the digital downloads, because nobody buys DVDs anymore. Yeah, but downloads only, downloads it, only. And it's like, I, I think I put 30%, I don't remember. But yeah, I got it up for a couple of days, so take advantage you got, of it. You got a huge discount, catchwrestle.com. Now, I'll tell you what, we, to us, our Bible, if you like, for ground fighting was Lost Art of Hooking. We would watch that, train it. And, you know, there's some people who are here today on here. They'll vouch for it. Me, Phil, Bart, Amit, Johnny Pants. We took some beating down there, right? And it's all Lost Art of Hooking and Johnny Pants helping us with it, right? If you don't have that Lost Art of Hooking, you're missing something out of your life. I'm telling you now. Now, yeah, the other yeah. thing is, the we're all on lockdown. The street. Huh? Yeah, I'm going to come on to that one, Tony. But the, the thing is, is that we're all 
on lockdown, near enough. Everybody in the world's on lockdown. Right. So you've got no excuse. If you come out of this lockdown without some new skills, you truly have wasted it. I see so many people saying, I'm bored. I'm bored. Or they do some silly thing or put up some silly video of somebody who's done something because they're bored. And they, yeah. Or they say, oh, look, here's another one where somebody put, you know, me before lockdown skinny, me after lockdown, but great big fat thing. Listen, learn some new skills. Get it up here. If you want some great new skills, use that code and go to catchrussell.com. Tony doesn't shout out about his stuff. I'm shouting out about it. I'm telling you now, you cannot get better than his stuff. I've been saying it for years. It's the best. There's nothing better. It, simple as that. Right. So lost art of hooking. That's what we had for you. And we worked off that for years. And then he brings out snap, no tap. Oh, we also were doing this um, physical stuff as well. The primer and the lucky 13 and all that stuff. The primer, we the, the warm up for his warm up. Most people can't do. It's true. The warm up for your warm up. The, the, your, I can't remember the name of it now. Was it the primer? The yeah, warm up. Lucky thirteen. Yeah. Yeah. That's all that calisthenics. That's for the, yeah. the gentleman that questioned. Most people, most, people, most people couldn't do the warm up in his warm up for the training. Right. That's how tough it was. This is the stuff. And use this code. Right now, snap no tap. Everything bought, bring up to date. Loads and loads of new stuff. This stuff fighting in the snow, in toilets, on the floor. There's all sorts of stuff, right? It's an absolute gold mine, and I can't believe that it's not the best seller on the interweb, right? Well, it should be. the street fight situation is this, and I, I will say this. You literally have to prepare to kill somebody or maybe lose your life. You cannot worry about your wife or your girlfriend or your children or whatever. You've got to focus on yourself and him. And you truly don't know what can happen in this encounter. You don't know this person. You don't know what else is going to happen. You don't know if the guy's going to have a heart attack or whatever. You've got to really be prepared to go all the way. You've got to have that uh, switch in yeah. your mind. You, you, you've got to just be ready to take it all the way home, man, if you have to. A lot of people just don't have that mentality, man. But if you haven't got that mentality, you haven't got it. And it's no. nothing to be ashamed of or anything like that. No. But this stuff, Tony's stuff, will help you develop that. And and if you if your mentality is such that you, you, you think you could never have it, don't worry about it. Learn Tony's stuff. It will develop you. It will help you. And if you're somebody who's pretty good anyway, it will take you another step forward. It will take you another level up. There's levels to everything. You know, even at the highest professional levels of boxing, there's levels, right? There's levels. And I'm telling you now, Tony stuff is the highest possible level. There's Thank you. People, people look at it with, with their eyes of their current level of understanding. So we, we equate it back to martial arts. People look at stuff with white belt eyes, yellow belt eyes, blue belt eyes, black belt eyes, six Dan eyes, one first Dan eyes, whatever. But there's so much there in layers for you to understand. If, and when if, I get you, done with the guy, he's going to be looking at me with black and blue eyes. <laughs> right? You, know, it, you can't get better than Tony stuff. I'm telling you now. I've been telling everybody. I keep saying it. Whenever, you know, it's it. And people I know who've learned Tony stuff, it's the best. Right? They've gone and... Got his stuff within a few months. They're demolishing people they struggled to beat before. It just in just in play around sports stuff. Within a couple of months of, of not even training with him directly, just off of the DVDs or back then or tapes and then DVDs. Yeah. Well, that's when I launched that distance learning program, you know, and I got yeah. people that train from the UK and all over the world via yeah. video. And a couple and of guys come over that I, I knew of that came over to train with time. Transformed transform <laughs> right obviously we're all on lockdown so you can only do it digitally at the minute but once the lockdown is over anybody who's over in america or anywhere anywhere in the world go and train with tony it's as simple as that because it's the best and i don't say that 
people who know me know I don't lie about anything, right? I tell the truth, even if it's a bad news to hear. I always tell the truth. Train with Tony. Well, thank Get you. his stuff. There's nothing better, and that's it. We we oh, we got one more thing coming. I think. Sorry if we got time. Um, oh, no, it's just people saying thank you. Thank you oh, to well, everybody. I okay, want to thank. I want to thank you guys for, for watching and inviting me out, Russell, for this. I appreciate it. And uh, I hope yeah, I most welcome. keep in touch with you guys. If you have any questions, yeah, uh, email and, me on my website. Yeah, and please, everybody, get in touch with Tony. And hopefully you'll come back soon, Tony, and do another one with us. That would be great if you could. Ta-ta for now. Cheerio, old chap. <laughs> hey, cheerio, Pip. Okay. Take care. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank All you. All right. Bye-bye. I don't know how to stop this now, but I'll try. Okay. okay. All right, Russell. Well, thanks for having me on. Thank you, Tony. Take care, and I'll speak to you soon. Okay, bye. Cheers. Take care. Bye. Goodbye.